V.S. Ramachandran is here. He is the director of the Center for Brain and Cognition at the University of California, San Diego. His work specializes in some of the brain's deepest mysteries. He believes that rare and unexplained disorders contain valuable insights into brain function. In the 1990s, he performed pioneering experiments on amputees suffering from the sensation of phantom limbs. Using a store-bought mirror on a piece of cardboard, he was able to cure them of pain in their amputated arms. He has since turned his attention to a wide range of topics, from perception to consciousness. I am pleased to have him here at this table for the first time. Welcome. Thank you, Charlie. Delighted to be here. I want to read something you said. Okay. Which I, this is like five shows right here. Even though it's common knowledge these days, it never ceases to amaze me that all the richness of our mental life, all of our feelings, our emotions, our thoughts, our ambitions, our love life, our religious sentiments, and even what each of us regards as his own intimate private self is simply the activity of these little specks of jelly in your head, in your brain. Yes, absolutely. Well, it is astonishing, and it still never ceases to amaze me. I mean, just think about it. It's Here's this mass of jelly, lump of jelly you can hold in your hand called the brain, and it can contemplate vastness of space, it can think about atoms, subatomic particles, uh, it can think about angels and unicorns, uh, it can think about infinity, the mathematical concept of infinity, it can even think about itself contemplating these things. And this is truly the most astonishing thing in the, in the universe as we know it. And what's the primary difference in the species? Well, um, this is a very contested issue, whether uh, whether we are merely more sophisticated, hairless apes who are just uh, quantitatively a little bit better than the great apes, or whether there's a sudden quantum jump in evolution which makes us human. I happen to believe the latter, that there are, there are in fact traits that are uniquely human. That, of course, it doesn't imply it didn't evolve from pre-existing structures because I'm not a creationist, I believe in Darwinian natural selection. Nevertheless, there are some novel styles of computing novel styles of information processing that are unique to the brain. Language is one striking example. Self-awareness is a striking example. I'm aware of myself to, to an extent that no great ape is aware of itself. They see red the same way you and I see red, but they don't ask themselves uh, questions like, who am I? Where am I from? Uh, you can reach for the stars, an ape can reach for a branch. How do you know that? Well. Very often in science, it's not a question of absolute proof, but circumstantial evidence. People have done experiments on apes, extensive experiments, to try and see what their cognitive abilities are. We're always amazed at how good they are. But things like self, being self-conscious and aware, and certainly language, people have tried to teach apes language, and you teach them a rudimentary form of sign language. But what they cannot do is what's called recursive embedding. For example, saying, John who hit Mary went to the ball. John who hit Mary went to the ball. You instantly know it's not Mary who went to the ball, but John. Right. That this hierarchic embedding of claws within claws is something that no great ape is capable of and we think is uniquely human. Well, the other things are things like laughter and humor. I mean, we are the laughing biped. They uh, don't laugh. They don't laugh. I mean, unless you count hyenas. But that's uh, <laughs> now, do, if they see themselves in a mirror, yes. what do they do? Well, it's a good question. When, when you confront, um, it's claimed that if you, of course, in initial exposure in, to a mirror, whether it's a child or an ape, it looks like another person. And for example, a monkey never gets used to the fact that it's a mirror image. Yeah. But a great ape, a chimpanzee, for example, and indeed a human, after experience with a mirror, seeing that the mirror image does everything, is a perfect perfectly replicates every one of your little it, movements, it. gives it the clue that this is not another strange creature, but it must be me. Now, only humans can say it is me and a reflection in the mirror. The apes habituate and get the hang of it. But the extraordinary thing is when an ape is anesthetized and you put a red patch on the forehead, and the ape wakes up and looks in the mirror, he immediately does this, wipes off the patch. So he does have some rudimentary sense of awareness of his body and realizes he has to do this to remove that spot. He doesn't reach into the mirror. So in that sense, it's not an all or none thing. It's not as awareness yeah, right. suddenly emerged out of the blue. Tell me about brain, the brain's plasticity. 
With regard to plasticity, it used to be believed that these connections in the brain, we're talking about 100 billion nerve cells in the average human brain, and each mm -hmm. nerve cell makes something like 1,000 to 10,000 contacts with other nerve cells. And the contacts can be inhibitory, can be excitatory, can be on, can be off. And someone has calculated that the number of brain states the number of possible permutations and combinations exceeds the number of elementary particles in the known universe. So how do you make these connections? So one view is it's all made by, the, by genes. Yeah. It's all there in the genome and fixed in infancy, and there's not much you can do when there's damage to the adult brain. So, for example, there is a stroke. The dogma has always been that there's a... So this ties into the whole modular view of brain function, that there are different highly specialized regions for vision and touch and hearing. And every point in the skin surface to, goes to a particular point in the brain, so on and so forth. So if you punch out a module, a function is lost, and that's it. So what we have learned from our experiments in the last 10, 15 years, and some of my colleagues in other institutions, is this is simply not true. Instead of thinking of punched out modules, you really think of this, these, it's a dynamic organism, almost, the brain. Hmm. And when there is something changing in the environment, or if even if there's damage or insult, it's not that there's a piece that's permanently removed, there's a shift in this equilibrium. So there is this mass of neurons that's in a state of equilibrium with the external world, and different parts are talking to each other and in equilibrium with each other. And when there's damage, there's a shift, and often yeah. all you need to do is a simple little trick to shift it back. Uh -huh. I once read somewhere that, and, and this may be allied or not, that everything you do in some way has some biological change in the brain. Absolutely. People who study the brain, most of us, would argue that any mental change, there's always a corresponding brain change. And this, in fact, is the main goal of the enterprise, to explain all mental functions, including things like self-awareness, in terms of uh, changes in neurons. But returning to plasticity, right. the, the main evidence, one of the main evidences for this in my lab is in amputees, right. phantom limbs. Right. It turns out there's a complete map of the surface of the body on the surface of the brain. Every point is represented on a particular point. And it also turns out that the map is not perfect, it's distorted. So the hand is right next to the face in that map. So what we find is when you amputate the arm, the question is, is there a hole in the brain corresponding to the arm? And the answer is there is no hole. The input from the face now takes over the region that once belonged to the hand. So you touch the guy on the face. Here's an amputee, you touch the guy on the face. He'll say, oh my God, you're touching my I phantom know. limb. And we were spooked out by this the first time we saw it, and then we realized what was going on. The input from the face, skin, is now innervating the hand area of the brain, and the hand area then informs higher centers in the brain. Your hand is being touched. Your phantom hand is being touched. And what's the technique for making that discovery? Two techniques. One is just simply touching the patient and asking him where he feels the sensations. And you find a perfect map of the missing hand on his face. So you'll say, that's the thumb, that's the index finger, that's the pinky. The other technique is to do brain imaging, where you actually see the map has changed. The other astonishing example of plasticity which we discovered was many patients with a phantom limb will say that the phantom is frozen stiff and they'll say it's in an awkward position. Now think about it, this is a phantom, it's not a real arm. This is, there's a charley horse, there's a cramp and it's in this excruciating position. If only I could move it, I might relieve the pain, but it's paralyzed, doctor. My phantom is paralyzed. Now this sounds like an oxymoron. How can a phantom be paralyzed? So we have an elaborate sort of theory about why it happens. But from a pragmatic standpoint, how do you make the arm move again to relieve the pain, if indeed it relieves the pain? So we simply put a mirror here in a box, yeah. and the patient looks at, so this is the phantom hand cramped in a painful position. You put a mirror here, and he clenches his normal hand, looks in the mirror, and it looks like his phantom has come back. You've resurrected his phantom. And then you ask him to mimic the posture of the phantom, so it's as though you've duplicated his normal arm, and what you see in the mirror is a reflection of the normal arm, but it looks like his phantom. Now the amazing thing is if he now moves the normal hand, yeah. it looks like the phantom is moving. Instantly it relieves the cramp and the phantom starts moving again. And in many patients, this seems to permanently relieve the pain from the phantom limb. Not in all patients, but about in a third. Does it matter when the amputation occurred? It seems to matter. It's not been studied carefully, but if it's, if it's done, if the mirror trick is done a few months or a year or two after amputation, that's when it works best. If you wait too long, say 10 years, 15 years, the phantom pain persists with a vengeance. Yeah. And even if you put the mirror, it doesn't help as much. What other diseases interest you? Well, a um, couple of, there are two agendas. One is to understand how the brain works, what is consciousness, what is mind. Right. And the other agenda is practical, how can you help people? 
So with regard to the practical, it now turns out that you can use a mirror trick even for stroke. So a patient has complete paralysis of the arm, a real arm, it's not amputated. Mm -hmm. And one out of six of us will have a stroke. And half of those people will have a paralysis of the arm. So this arm is paralyzed and you can't move, there's no flicker of movement even when you try. This is called a stroke. And this is because the motor fibers which go from the cortex down the spinal cord to the arm are cut. So the standard assumption is that's it, you can't do anything about it. Now what we suggested is maybe there's a component of the stroke, what's called learned paralysis. There's initially some paralysis but the brain just gives up. So not all the paralysis is due to permanent damage. Some of it is a sort of learned paralysis. So if you put a mirror and start moving the normal hand, so this is an experiment I did with Eric Ulschuler, a colleague of mine, then it gives the appearance that the arm with the stroke, the paralyzed arm, is moving. A strictly visual appearance, you realize, is not actually moving. After a few days of this, in some patients, the arm actually starts moving, the phantom arm, simply by giving him a visual illusion that the, that the paralyzed arm is moving, the paralyzed arm starts literally moving to different extents in different patients and doesn't work at all in some patients, but in many patients, the substantial recovery of function. So we've now applied this mirror technique to pain, pain caused by strokes, paralysis caused by strokes, phantom pain, number of other conditions. But the other agenda we have is basic science. In other words, understanding how the brain works. Right. Let's go back to phantom limbs, right? Right. Here's a person, arm is amputated, he's got a phantom, and this is spooky enough. This has been known for 100 years. And people wondered what it was, and I, when in medical school, I would encounter patients with a missing arm, with a phantom, and I would also always ask, you know, what is this? You know, and the patients ask, I'm as puzzled as a patient. Just a few, a year or so ago, we found, and this is unrelated to what I was telling you about with the mirrors and all that, if I simply go and touch a normal person on his normal hand, and the patient with the phantom limb watches the person, he feels it in his phantom limb. So, assuming I have a phantom limb, and somebody touches you, Charlie, right. on the hand, I feel it in my phantom. Now, this sounds like X-Files, but we've repeated it in a large number of patients. Why does this happen? So, this is worthy of Sherlock Holmes, right. okay? Why does it happen? Why would a human being feel a touch administered to another human being? It turns out there's a bunch of neurons in the front of the brain, which were discovered in Italy, and these are called mirror neurons. And these neurons, they, they occur in the front of the brain, but they also occur in the back of the brain. They fire when somebody were to touch my real hand, yeah. okay? They're called sensory neurons. So somebody comes and touches my real hand, these neurons fire. That's been known for 50 years, 100 years, in fact. When we say neurons fire, what does that mean? That means the brain is made up of the of nerve cells, which are the fundamental structural functional units of the nervous system. And a neuron means nerve cell, It's just a highly specialized form of cell, which the brain uses. A lot of the cells in the brain are, in fact, neurons, which, which are used in exchange of information. So when I touch your hand, or somebody touches my hand, there's a hand area in the brain where the neurons fire. I mean, that's, there's a hotline, if you like, from the touch receptors in your hand to the sensory touch area in the brain. So far, so good, okay? Right. The new discovery made by the Italians is that some of these neurons, about a third of them, will fire even if somebody touches Charlie. And I'm simply watching, and I'm, right. so, so, so they're empathy neurons, okay? So they're saying, Charlie is being touched, I ought to empathize with Charlie, so I will feel the touch myself, so I feel the empathy, but I don't literally feel the touch. The question is, why do, why do I not literally feel it? I empathize, I know you're being touched, right? I know what it feels like to be touched, right? I do a virtual reality in my brain of yeah. your brain, but somebody, but it doesn't feel like somebody's touching me. And that's because my, thing, my hand, my skin receptors are telling the brain, look buddy, you're not being touched, don't worry, Charlie's being touched. You can empathize by all means, but don't worry, you're not being touched. And so where does this line of reasoning take us? I'm coming to that. If you remove the arm, that signal doesn't come through, and I start feeling your touch sensations. Ah. Okay? So here's a great medical mystery, and you solve it by looking at neurons in the brain. Now, the advantage is, now if somebody comes and massages you, Charlie, I feel the massage in my phantom, and the pain in the phantom starts fading and disappearing. Now, this needs to be done in controlled studies. It's something we just discovered. But it tells you an example of how you can take a bunch of neurons, nerve cells, study their properties in monkeys and in humans, look at a patient who's lost an arm, make a prediction, and you see something really spooky, he experiences your sensations, and lo and behold, you now can use it therapeutically. Not only that, just for fun, I call these neurons Gandhi neurons, because they are involved in empathy, 
And once I remove the skin, it dissolves the barrier between me and you, literally. So I experience your sensations. And why do you say understanding neurons is part of the great leap forward to understanding human evolution? Well, I think mirror neurons, which that's what these neurons are ca right. called, uh, they'll fire when I move, the motor neurons, they'll fire when you move. So they're involved in creating a virtual reality simulation of your movements. In other words, I don't see you as a puppet moving. I have a, 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 an internal image of Charlie who has intentions and he's reaching out to grab the cup. Okay? So this construction of another human being in your mind relies to some extent on these neurons called mirror neurons. And it turns out in order to imitate somebody, you need mirror neurons because how do I imitate a complex action? You take this glass and you drink it. Right. A human child sees it once and maybe just seeing it once or twice does it immediately. It turns out monkeys can't do that. Even though commonly people believe they can do that, they're very bad at it. So they have mirror neurons, but they're not as sophisticated ours, as ours. We have mirror neurons which can perform a sophisticated virtual re reality simulation of your brain, of Charlie reaching out and grabbing the cup and drinking, and then reenacted in my brain in one trial and reaching out, grabbing and drinking. This is very human. A polar bear has to, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of years, to evolve as a fur coat through natural selection. A human child watching its mother hunt and skin a polar bear, watches it once or twice, and does it in one generation. That's the tremendous advance of cultural transmission over natural selection. What takes millions of years through natural selection and trial and error, as a result of mirror neurons and the great leap forward, you can achieve in one generation. And this is what makes human beings utterly different from any great ape or animal. We have this rich, sophisticated culture made possible partly by emulation and imitation. You started this whole range of conversation talking about the search for understanding consciousness. Yes. How far along are we? Well, we've barely, barely scratched the surface, I would say. It's a problem that is so um, enigmatic that we don't even know how to state it, how to define it. Not many people agree that it's even a problem. People say it's just playing with words. I think there is a genuine problem here. You know, there are neurons, nerve cells firing in my brain, and I see green or I see red. There's nothing red about the neurons, a bunch of little specks of jelly firing away. Mm. How is it I experience redness or greenness or blueness or love or charity or pity with these neurons firing away? That's the basic problem. And in fact, there are two sides to the problem. One is the awareness of red or green or blue. And then there is the self-awareness. I am aware of me as a person who endures in time Despite all this diversity of experiences around me, I, you know, I came and met you today, this morning I took a taxi, I wanted to go to the Metropolitan Museum, A, B, C, D, there's a sense of continuity in time, and all these diverse experiences I have, but there's a single sort of golden thread that's running through the whole fabric of my experience. This is called the unity of consciousness. So there is unity, there's continuity, there's embodiment. I feel I'm in here, you know, I don't feel I'm out there. Sometimes that goes wrong and I have an out-of-body experience. Right? So all of these aspects of consciousness, we're going to chip away at the problem and study them one by one and solve them. We're making giant steps forward to understand the brain because we're getting much closer to getting insight into the biology of the brain. That's absolutely right. And even spooky questions like what is consciousness? Even understanding, to interrupt, how psychotherapy, psychotherapy yes. affects biology. Right. Or vice versa. Okay, vice versa. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, psychotherapy is, is way out there. I mean, right. we still haven't got there. But in terms of seeing red or seeing green, you have to start somewhere in science. Start with the simple questions. Right. And eventually we'll get to that, hopefully. So supposing you look at something and I see, I see it. I'm conscious of it. Nobody can take that away from me. I am conscious. The one thing I'm absolutely certain of yeah. is that I'm seeing this. Experiments have been done in Oxford where they've shown there are, in fact, two pathways in the brain. If I damage the visual area in the brain, obviously there's a big, huge blind spot. No vision is coming in, and I can't see that cup, okay? But guess what? Some of these people will reach out and grab the cup. And you say, how is that possible? You've damaged the visual area in the brain. They're reaching out, grabbing the cup. Well, it turns out there are different visual areas in the brain. And there's a parallel pathway that yeah. goes from the cup to the other visual areas that's not conscious. It's only the pathway that goes to the visual cortex that's conscious. Now, that's amazing, because it's telling you some regions of the brain are conscious. Other regions of the brain can do elaborate things like grab cups or drive a car without your being conscious of it. 
So then you can ask what's special about these neurons and these circuits that makes consciousness possible. Just like you said, what's special about the double helix right. that makes hereditary heredity possible. I mean, people thought this is an insoluble problem. Why do pigs give birth to pigs? Why don't people give birth to pigs? You know, why do pe people only give birth to people? How come the resemblance? It all starts with an egg. And Watson and Crick homed, homed in on the double helix right, right. and say that the complementarity of the helix dictates the complementarity of the offspring and parent, and they solved it. Likewise, we want to find out in neural circuitry, what, how does the, what is the anatomy of the brain, what are the circuits that dictate the function that we call consciousness or visual awareness. And we're heading that direction. We haven't got very far, but we're heading there. Because it's getting so much attention, bring in another brain illness, which is autism. Mm -hmm. How does that relate to mirror neurons? That's an excellent question. Autism is a very controversial topic, and people have been studying it for 20, 30 years. The incidence seems to be increasing. We don't know if it's really increasing or it's simply earlier diagnosis. Um, the characteristics out of the, 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 the child has no empathy and very little eye contact, has poor language skills, for example, or poor joint attention. Normally when you look at the cup, I look at it, see what's going on there. Or pointing, you point to something, I'm, I'm the person, I'm the child, I look at yeah. where you, that's a very human thing right. to do. But this child will look at your finger when you're pointing something. So there is no shared mind, and this is very critical in autism. Now, it depends on what you mean by cause. Cause meaning, people have suggested vaccines, viruses, heavy metals, the evidence linking all of that is, tenure, is tenuous. But coming to the brain, what circuits have changed in the brain? And there are lots of different changes have been observed throughout the brain. The cerebellum is altered. My colleague, Dr. Cruchain, has shown that. Other parts of the brain are altered. But then we were struck by the fact that if you look at the properties of mirror neurons, the mirror neurons are involved in constructing a theory of other minds, in simulating other minds. They must be involved in imitation, emulation, taking your point of view because that's what the mirror neuron is doing. It's firing when I move my hand. It's also firing when you move your hand, saying, hey, Charlie's doing the same thing that I'm doing, okay? So it's constructing a model of your mind and what your intentions are. And this seems to be deficient in autism. And also imitation, empathy. They're very bad at pretend play. You know, all our kids have superheroes and they pretend. They, they tr temporarily transport themselves from their own bodies to inside the superhero. The autistic children are not able to do that. So if you make a list of all of this, all of these things that are deficient in autism, similarly, autistic children get confused between pronouns, you and me, okay? All of these, I think, are functions of mirror neurons. So it's, it can't be a coincidence. This is why we suggested that the core def deficit in autism is a deficit in mirror neuron function. And, uh, Lindsay Obermann and Eric Altschuler and I proposed this about 10 years ago. And since then, there are a lot of studies confirming it. But I would still say the evidence is suggestive, but, but not conclusive. All right, so say compelling, but not conclusive. So where's the controversy? Well, the controversy, well, the, I don't know. <laughs> the usual controversy is that there's not enough evidence. You need to do more, more intensive studies, that the techniques we use to discover the loss of mirror neurons are not adequate to clearly demonstrate the loss those kinds of objections. Theoretically, there'd be no, as far as I know, there'd be no objections. Back to localization, you know, Parkinson's. Yeah. What do we know about exactly where, whatever it is in the brain that causes Parkinson is located? Well, we actually, that, that's a good disease to talk about because even though it's not what I specialize in, yeah. a great deal is known about the precise centers. There's a structure called substantia nigra, right. globus pallidus. These are all basal ganglia involved in automatic automatic postural adjustments, or when I walk, you know, you swing your arms. And when you're swinging your arms, you don't do it consciously. That's done by the basal ganglia. Parkinson's, Parkinson's patients hold their arms rigid. They don't swing them. They don't have spontaneous facial expression. They have a mask-like face, because that's also something we do spontaneously, and the basal ganglia are involved. So these groups of structures are deficient in a transmitter called dopamine, right? right. And they don't smile, mask-like expression, they have rigidity, they also have tremor, and we know roughly where, what parts of the brain are involved, what chemical is missing. You can replace dopamine with a, with a substance called L-dopa, right. which crosses the blood-brain barrier and replaces it. There's often tremendous relief from symptoms. Unfortunately, it's, it's a fine line. If you give too much, you get too many involuntary symptoms. You get ticks and grimaces yeah. and that sort of thing. Now there's a promising technique called deep brain stimulation where you can put an electrode in the, inside the brain, stimulate the globus pallidus, partially alleviate many of the symptoms, and that's showing considerable problems. That's, what do we learn from people who are, in a sense, made to feel better, 
because of the, the, the psychological benefit of counseling? Oh, I think there's evidence that talk therapy helps. There's evidence that Prozac helps. But the effects are quite small. You know, you're talking about if you do placebo, just talk to your friend versus take Prozac. Right, right. If you talk to a friend, it's like 55, 60%. If you take Pro Prozac, it's 70, 70, 75%. I may be off by 5, 10%, right. but 75%. Talk therapy with a trained therapist can be very helpful too. But these are marginal effects and what we, because we don't really understand the psychopathology. Let me give you an example, right? Where you, one of the things we're interested in is boundary disorders. That is disorders that straddle the boundary between psychiatry and neurology. Right. Well, and those are, that's where to go. And where, well, give me an example of that. Well, one example is here's a chap who has uh, had a head injury uh, or, uh -huh. in fact, sometimes just a schizophrenia. And he says, he looks at his mother and says, this woman is an imposter. She's not my mother. Sometimes it takes a slightly paranoid flavor. She's coming after me. She's not really my mother. Now, the amazing thing about these syndromes is the chap is completely normal in other respects. He can do mathematics, he can play chess, he laughs, he sings, he's social, he, he holds his He just doesn't own. recognize his mother. No. He recognizes her in the sense he says it looks like right, right, right. but there's no empathy. Okay, so what, why does this happen? So the standard psychiatric Freudian view has been, oh, well, what's going on here is all of us, when you're little babies, we have a strong sexual attraction to your mother, so-called Oedipus complex of right. Freud. I'm not saying I believe this, but just sort of Freudian view. And then as a child grows up into adulthood, the cortex develops and inhibits these latent sexual urges. Therefore, you and I, when you look at, you look at your mother, you're not sexually turned on. Thank God, right? But then a blow comes to the head, damages the cortex. And you go back? And then you go back. So the, the, the latent sexual urges come to the surface. So this chap says, if this is my mom, why am I feeling a bit sexually aroused? It doesn't, uh -huh. doesn't make sense. And he says, this can't be my mom. Oh, I see. Okay, so this is the standard old view. What we showed was there's a neurological explanation. Right. It turns out that you look at anything in the world, whether it's trivial like a piece of wood, or exciting like uh, you know, uh, like a tiger or a lion or a right. sexually attractive person, whatever, or indeed your mother. Okay, something that's significant uh, comes to you. It goes into the visual areas in the brain, goes into the visual recognition system. There's an area for recognizing faces. Nancy Kanwisher and others have shown this, area for recognizing faces. And from that area, messages go into an area called the amygdala. Right. And the right. amygdala is involved in gauging the emotional significance of what you're looking at. Is this a predator? Is it a lion? I have to take action. I have to run away. Is it a mate? I have to pursue. Your heart starts beating. You start sweating. Right? Blood pressure goes up. Or is it a piece of driftwood or a piece of chalk? I just ignore it. You don't want your alarm bells going on all the time. Okay? Okay. What's the connection between this and my patient? Okay, I'm coming to that, right? Now, in these patients, what happens is you, and you and I, we have this recognition area called fusiform gyrus, right. which recognizes faces, recognizes umbrellas, tables, and chairs, sends the message to the amygdala, which responds emotionally. In these patients, the amygdala is normal, so they can see everything, uh, they react to things emotionally, react to sounds emotionally, they, they laugh at jokes, for example. But when they see the, anything emotionally salient, like their mother, the ma message goes to the Fusiform gyrus and recognized as a mother, but the wire that goes from the face area to the amygdala has been cut by the accident. So the net result is, he says, this looks like my mother because the recognition area is normal. But if it looks like my mother, why am I not experiencing any warm glow or terror, as the case may be, even though she looks like my yeah. mother? The only way I can make sense of this is to say she's an imposter. Hmm. Then we tested this using a very simple experiment, which took about an hour. And it turned out that we were right. There's a disconnection between vision and emotion. Vision is normal. Emotion is normal. Facial recognition is normal. But facial recognition is disconnected from emotions. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Hope we can do this again. I'd love to. We'll be right back. Stay with us.